Hi, welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. This is Chaplain Greg. And uh, if you are enjoying this video series, which we are finishing today, um, please like and subscribe and uh, share, comment. Uh, love to hear your thoughts. So we are finishing Walking in the Word. We've gone from Genesis. We've gone to Revelation, which was our uh, sermon last week. And I'm finishing with the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John is a gospel that sort of encompasses everything that we've talked about in all of these episodes. Um, he, he brings the, the Old Testament and this New Covenant together in a way that is just masterful. So we're going to talk about the Gospel of John today. And when we talk about the Gospel of John, there are three themes that we look for. The first theme, and this is the strongest, Jesus is God. It is a strong, strong theme. There's a lot of critics of Christianity who say that that was invented later on in the Christian church, that the original believers did not believe Jesus was God. They haven't read John. John makes a very strong case that Jesus is God. The second theme is Jesus is equal to God. That not only is Jesus God, but he has equality with God. He's not a second subservient part of the Godhead. He is equal with God. And the third theme, the salvation of all nations. Everybody is through Jesus. Now there are three reasons why John wrote his gospel. Why another gospel? And, G and John wrote this well after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So he knew about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, the first reason is evangelism. He wanted to bring more people to faith in Jesus. So he wanted to provide more context to the story, some of his memories and recollections, but framed in a very theological way. Um, he wanted to strengthen the church, strengthen them not only encouraging them during times of persecution, but strengthen them theologically so that they could be well grounded for the arguments that false teachers were bringing to the church. He writes in uh, chapter 20, verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you may, that and that by believing you may have life in his name that is the theme of the gospel of john it's written so that you can believe that jesus is the messiah the son of god and that by believing you have faith in his name so let's talk about the distinctiveness of john 92 percent of john is new material meaning that it's not found in uh, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Uh, major life events and miracles are not presented or they're diminished a bit. So his birth, baptism, the temptation, exorcism, transfiguration, or the institution of the Eucharist, all of these are either not included or they're smaller parts of the story. I think that's not because John doesn't think they're important. He probably thinks that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did a much better job telling those stories, so why retell it? Um, but in those that he does include that are diminished, yeah, there are important parts of the story, but I want to tell you a, a, another part of that. John focuses on eternal life and resurrection, whereas the synoptics focus on the teachings and miracles culminating with the resurrection okay so eternal life and new creation and resurrection jesus's teachings are more drawn out conversations there's lots of conversations in the gospel of john instead of having parables so we know that luke loves his parables he has tons of parables so does matthew 
not so much in John, but John has tons of conversations, long drawn out conversations. You think John 3 and Nicodemus, that's a long conversation in there. John also puts seven signs of Jesus' divinity into his gospel. And he names uh, two of them as being signs, and then he lets you figure out the rest of them. So the first one is water turned into wine. That's John 2, 1 through 11. The second one is healing of the nobleman's uh, son who was near death. That's John 4, 46 through 54. The third sign is the healing of the lame man at the pool. John 5, 1 through 17. Feeding of the 5,000 is the fourth sign, and that's John 6, 1 through 15. Walking on the water, that'd be John 6, 16 through 21. Healing of the man born blind, John 9, uh, 1 through 41. We're going to have a sermon on that in a couple of weeks. Um, raising Lazarus from the dead, that's John 11. 1 through 47. That's the seventh sign. So those seven signs of Jesus' divinity are throughout the Gospel of John. Now, if that wasn't enough, John also presents seven I am statements. Remember, going back to Exodus, Yahweh, he is, or Echa. I am is the name of God. It's the name God chose for himself. The self-defining name that means I am who I am. I am not defined by anyone else. There are seven I am statements throughout John. First one, I am the bread of life. John 6, 35. I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. I am the gate, John 10, 7. I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11, and 14. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. And finally, I am the true vine, John 15, 1. Now, one of the distinctives of John also is his introduction. So John 1, 1 through 18 is kind of a prologue to the entire gospel. It's kind of an overture. So if you're uh, a fan of operas, let's say, before an opera starts or a musical starts, if you're a fan of musicals, there's usually an overture, which will give you musical themes that you're going to hear throughout the, the opera or the musical. Um, one of my favorite bands is The Who, and they have Tommy, and Tommy's Overture has lots of different musical signatures of, um, uh, uh, of, of music that you're going to hear throughout the, throughout, throughout the opera, the rock opera. Um, so it's a gold mine, and you have to dig it out. You have to dig out from it what it offers you. It is so worth studying and restudying John 1, 1 through 18. It incorporates Greek philosophy, a Jewish worldview, and the reader needs to distinguish between those two things. There are five sections. Verses 1 through 5 is about the Word. Verses 6 through 8 and then verse 15 is about John the Baptist's ministry. Verses 9 through 11 talk about being the light of the world. And finally, verses 12 through 13 talk about receiving the world and becoming children of the king. I'm sorry, finally, number five, ministry of the word. Verse 14 and then 16 through 18. So let's walk through this, okay? And I'm going to give you a lot of Greek. All right, I'm going to give you so much Greek that you're probably going to want to go out and get some gyro and a hummus and, uh, and um, maybe some, uh, you know, flaming cheese. Opa! Uh, I'm just kidding. But we're going to do a lot of Greek because it's worth digging into. So in the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, 
God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Um, John 1.1, 1, 1, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, intentionally linking together. In the beginning, was the Word. Okay, he didn't say, was Jesus. He says, was the Word. Logos. Has a few, logos has a few different meanings. It means a spoken or written collection of consonants and vowels ascribed to a specific meaning. So the word, word, means, you know, word. Um, the word, um, the word car means a vehicle with four wheels that moves and gets people from place to place. So words mean things. Uh, in Jewish theology, God's creative and sustaining word, it's prophetic, and it's the pre-existent Torah. So in Jewish theology, word means, uh, it, it points directly to who God is. In Greek philosophy, uh, the Stoics believed the it, Logos was the eternal knowledge, the knowledge that surpasses all other knowledge, um, uncaused cause, the ultimate reason why all things happen. Um, in Philo philosophy, the, it's a, the eternal mind, the agent of creation, the mediator between the eternal and the finite. So, so John is using this word specifically to show the fullness of the incarnation. He's not giving the story of the birth. Luke did a great job doing that, but he's giving the meaning behind the birth. It's logos, and he's incorporating both Greek and Hebrew philosophy and using this word, logos, word. The eternal has come to dwell with the finite, as well as to link Jesus to Yahweh and the Torah. Jesus was pre-existent as God. He was involved with the creation and is thus superior to the creation. And the word, logos, was with God and the word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. Pros was close to, was nearby. The word was with, pros to God. Indicates both equality and distinctiveness. The word was an intimate, equal relationship with God for eternity. God, theos. So our Jehovah's Witness friends incorrectly translate this as a God. It really is God, capital T. Even though it's not used capitals in Greek, there's no article preceding theos. So this is an indication of God, his nature, as, being, as a being rather as a person or as an individual entity. Verse 3. Let's go to verse 3. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not a thing was created that has been created. So, common in ancient literature to restate themes. So, he's restating this. The statement adds further power to the eternality, creative power, and equality of the word Jesus with God. Geomai, made, constructed, created, came into being, born. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Zoe, life, both physical, present, and spiritual, future existence. Phos, light, divine light, separating humanity from creation. That's a Jewish idea. Verse 5, that light, that phos, shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. So darkness, skosha, darkness, but also evil, sin, ignorance. That's the first section. Second section, uh, verses 6 through 8, the ministry of John the Baptist. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. John assumes, and so the apostle John who's writing this, assumes his audience know, knows who John is from the other Gospels, and as further information to identify, it, it's not explained. So if you want, look at Luke 1 um, through 3, verses 1 through 20. Uh, verses 7 through 8 and then 15, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. 
He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Okay, so we're talking about testimony here, which is the Greek word martyria, which is a legal witness providing evidence. It's where we get the word martyr from, martyria, a legal witness providing evidence. Um, martyrio is to be a witness or to testify. The logos, Jesus, came to bring light, fast to humanity, so John came, John the Baptist came to point to that light and the need for that light as they were living, the world was living in darkness. All right, continuing on. John 1, 9 through 11, the light in the world. Verse 9, the, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So, Elethanos, genuine, not false. It's real. It's not fake. Verses 10 11. He was not in the world, and the world was, he was in, I'm sorry, he was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So the focus is now back to Jesus. Cosmos. For the first two uses, it's, it's referring to the entirety of creation, the world. He came into the world, the cosmos. And uh, yet the world, the cosmos, did not recognize him. Okay? The third usage refers to the world of men. Okay, his own people, his own cosmos, did not receive him. Gnosko, no did not know, have intimate knowledge or recognize. Moving on to John 1, verses 12 through 13, receiving the word and becoming children of the king. These two verses are the fulcrum of the passage. So you think of a fulcrum, you go up, and then you're going to go down. Not that it's descending, but it's going to be moving on to a transition. Um but to all who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. So notice the difference there between rejection and reception. It's the same contrast that we saw between darkness and light. Receiving, believing, trusting, Believing in Jesus gives us the excusia, the power to be called children of God. Believing in someone's name <coughs> believes that you have trust in that person as a whole, not of natural descent. This is aimed at Jewish believers. Their birth as Jews did not save them. Uh, being born of God is not a natural or physical birth, but a spiritual birth. And this foreshadows his conversation with Nicodemus in chapter 3. John 14, uh, 1, 14, and then 16 through 18 is talking about the ministry of the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Again, the incarnation, the eternal Word enters his creation. He's no longer outside the creation. He's in his creation. We observe his glory, and that statement equates Jesus to God as, glor as the glory cloud in the tabernacle or the temple, the glory of God, the glory as one and only Son from the Father. So, versions that have only begotten miss the power of the word manganese, which is one and only one, one and only one. It gives a character of utter uniqueness. He is fully equal with God and can reveal the Father, full of grace and truth. Charis kai elathia, full of grace and truth, used here and in verse 17. And there are the only places in the New Testament where this is used. Uh, in, in the Septuagint, it's used all throughout 
um, uh, as a substitute for a chassad we amet, full of grace and truth. But Jesus is full of chassad. Remember that sermon that I gave on chassad and what that means, God's ever faithful, never-ending love. God's everlasting and faithfulness and his emet, his truth will never end. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. We have received immeasurable chassad when we put our faith, hope, and trust into Jesus. The law, which exposes our sin, came from Moses and could never provide grace. Only Jesus, through Yahweh, could provide chassad we amet grace and truth no one has ever seen god the only one the one and only son who is himself god and is at the father's side ha- he has revealed him kolpas he is at the father's side kolpas which means it's an intimate hug it's not just being next to him it's an intimate hug jesus is intimately near the Father as God. I want to finish this series by encouraging you to read Revelation 21 and 22. I'll need to act. Revelation 21 and 22 give a glimpse into the hope that we have of new creation. We've been through this whole series. We've talked about how God has worked through humanity, how humanity over and over again rebels against him, even though he provides a way out. I want to encourage you to read Revelation 21 and 22 and meditate upon our future. It's our future, new creation. So that finishes Walking in the Word. We're going to have uh, three sermons coming up uh, called The Unexpected Evangelists, Three Unexpected Evangelists. Um, After that, we're going to start a study on the Gospel of Mark. So until then, this is Chaplain Greg. Uh, with the Wandering Wesleyan. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and uh, share it, comment below. Um, It's been an honor presenting this material to you, and uh, I'd like to hear more from you. But until next week, God bless.